Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing to all of you Dr. Dana Goldsmith, who is a veterinarian that specialized in veterinary anatomic pathology. She completed vet school here in Calgary in 2013 as part of the second class to graduate from the new vet school. She then completed a three-year residency in anatomic pathology at UC Davis in California. And after that, she worked for a couple of years in, the di in a diagnostic lab in California uh, before returning to Calgary in 2019 to work as a faculty member at the vet school and at the diagnostic services unit, which is where she's working now. So um, welcome, Dana, and I'll just let you jump in as soon as you're ready. Sorry, I have to come back in here. John, could you please share your screen, seeing as you're the host tonight, and then Dana can get her slides up. Hopefully. Come on, John, let me share my screen. <laughs> Hopefully he's still there. He immediately fell asleep. John, are you there? He's going to get a coffee. Uh, okay, I can't share my screen. Thank oh, I can now. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. There you go. Okay, great. Can you guys see the presentation in presentation mode, hopefully? Yeah. Okay, and I'm just going to pull, I'm going to keep the chat box open. Thanks for the intro, and. Um, I'll keep the chat box open. I definitely like talks that are more interactive, so feel free to ask questions as we go, and I'll try and answer them. Um, so the, the subject for this talk is avian influenza, specifically the current outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza um, that's kind of happening across North America right now. You guys may or may not know what a veterinary anatomic pathologist is, so I'm going to kind of start with a bit more of an introduction to who I am and what I do here. Um, and a big warning for those of you who might be a little bit more squeamish, um, I am going to be showing pictures of dead animals as well as some videos of sick animals. I'll try and warn you um, before the videos especially because some people may find them a little bit disturbing, um, but they're an important part of what I do, so I want to share them with you. So feel free to look away at those parts. So veterinary anatomic pathology. This is the first of the gross pictures. So this is me wearing a nice Tyvek suit and an N95 mask that we all know too much about now. Um, so basically pathology means the study of disease and anatomic pathology means specifically studying disease by doing um, what we call necropsies, which are autopsies on animals, usually to figure out the cause of death, sometimes the extent of disease, and then also looking at biopsies. So any lumps or bumps that get taken off of mostly pet animals um, come to us for diagnosis. So I look at a lot of tissues, um, both with my eyes and then with my microscope to help diagnose disease. Um, I work for a lab called the Diagnostic Services Unit, which Anne mentioned, that's part of the vet school here in Calgary. So we are a fee-for-service diagnostic lab, which means that people pay us to do diagnostics on domestic and wild animals. Um, we do gross pathology, which is the autopsy component of what I do. We do histopathology, which is looking at things with the microscope. We also have a brand new um, bacteriology lab, so we can do bacterial cultures on things. Um, and so we work with a lot of uh, veterinarians out in the community, as well as researchers across the province and sometimes outside of the province too. Um, there, here's a link if anybody's interested in learning more about the Diagnostic Services Unit. We have a pretty nice website you can look up. And I will share this presentation with Anne at the end, um, especially for the links that are included at the very end, which have a whole bunch more information about influenza if you guys want to learn more. I also have the role of being the regional director uh, for the Alberta node of the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, or CWHC, which some of you may have heard of, I hope. This is a national wildlife health program that's run primarily out of six nodes across the country, most of which I think four out of the, no, five out of the six are located at the five major vet schools across Canada. And then the sixth one is located in BC at one of the government diagnostic labs. So this group does mostly passive surveillance investigation and research into wildlife health, um, looking at kind of baseline disease, looking at outbreak situations, and then looking for solutions to help mitigate wildlife disease. 
Uh, and the CWH is an important voice for wildlife disease across Canada. So moving on to talk about influenza. So influenza is also known as the flu. It's a viral infection, something we're all very familiar with these days. It's kind of nice talking to audiences now that everybody has a higher baseline of knowledge about these things. Um, influenza virus specifically is a negative sense, single-stranded env enveloped RNA virus from the family Orthomyxoviridae. That probably doesn't mean very much to most of you, but I'm gonna explain it a little bit more. There are four basic types of influenza. We call them types A, B, C, and D. And the one that we talk about um, most commonly is actually gonna be type A. So type A and B can affect people and they're what cause our seasonal flu. We're going into flu season right now. I just got my shot, I think this week or last week maybe. So we're all pretty familiar with that. Um, pandemics in people tend to also be type A and the type of flu that affects birds is also a type A influenza which is part of why we talk about it a lot. Type A also has the ability to affect other species like dogs, horses, pigs, bats. And I think the last one's mink, there we go. Um, but we're gonna talk specifically about type A influenza viruses and how they affect birds and specifically focusing for this group on wild birds. And that's most of what I've been dealing with for the last um, four months at the diagnostic lab. So naming of influenza viruses is a little bit complicated and important to kind of understand in order to talk about them more. So basically influenza virus consists of a bunch of RNA or protein, uh, sorry, genetic material sitting at the center of an envelope of protein. And two of the proteins that make up this envelope are called hemagglutinin, which is abbreviated as an H and neuraminidase, which is abbreviated as an N. And there are a whole bunch of different types of both of these proteins. So 18 different types of Hs, 11 different types of N. And we name the specific types of viruses based on which type of each of these proteins they have. So if you think back to 2009, when a bunch of us got vaccinated for the H1N1 or Heine flu, um, that's where that name comes from. So that specific strain of influenza had a type 1 H protein and a type 1 N protein. The strain that we're gonna talk about today that's currently affecting wild birds is an H5N1 strain. So how do new strains occur? You are all well aware that viruses like to mutate um, and depending on the type of virus, they may mutate a lot or just a little bit. Influenza viruses like to mutate quite frequently, which is why uh, we all get a different version of the vaccine every year. And Avian or influenza viruses are pretty simple viruses, actually. They only have eight different gene segments. And these gene segments can actually be swapped between different strains of viruses. We call this reassortment when it happens, and this is what generates um, a new strain of virus. And this reassortment tends to only happen when you have one individual that's affected by more than one type of virus at once. Then you can get this exchange of genes and new strains of virus evolving. Um, pigs are really important when we talk about influenza virus reassortment because they can be infected by a whole bunch of different types of influenza strains. So they're an important mixing vessel for these viruses and they're often a place that we look when we have new um, influenza viruses that develop. So um, they can be infected by strains of virus that affect birds as well as strains of viruses that affect people. One of the kind of hot spots where influenza viruses like to evolve and make new strains is in the wet markets of Southeast Asia, which is um, where they hypothesize um, that the current Asian strain of influenza came from and probably our current strain that we're dealing with as well, potentially evolved in these wet markets. And that's because they have a lot of mixing of a variety of different species in those markets. So pigs in Alberta and across North America tend to be kept really isolated from other species. And so the risk of of them being infected with weird strains of virus is actually pretty low. They might get a human virus on occasion, um, but they're not likely to catch an avian influenza virus versus a place like a wet market in Asia where they have tons of mixing, kind of minimal biosecurity protection to prevent transmission of viruses, probably also slightly more dirty conditions. Um, so that's kind of a hot spot for the development of new viral strains. And because of that, groups like the OIE, which is now called WOAH, um, and the WHO keep track 
of any new developing strains of viruses, especially any that show the potential to move into people. So um, occasionally as a veterinarian, I've come across these strains and those strains will always be reported to the OIE um, so that they can kind of keep track of them across the country. Zoonotic, for those of you who don't know what that word means, um, it basically means a disease that has the ability to move from animals into people. So moving on to talk specifically about avian flu viruses. So I told you already that they're group A viruses and they receive kind of a special designation as either being high pathogenicity strains or low pathogenicity strains. And that's based purely on the way that they behave in domestic poultry populations. So if they cause high mortality in domestic poultry, um, they will be designated as high path. If they cause low mortality, they'll be designated as low path. And there are certain strains of viruses that are more likely to be the high path ones. And those are anything that are H5 and H7 types of flu. So we pay particular attention to those. Um, they are considered any of those H5 or H7 strains are reportable for me as a veterinarian. So anytime I identify one of those strains, they have to be reported to the CFIA, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And then CFA are the ones who are going to be responsible anytime there is an outbreak to kind of go in and manage that outbreak, including the current one. So why do we care about avian influenza? Um, the biggest reason that people care is because it can have huge impacts on the poultry industry, which has a lot of money invested into it. So unlike some viruses, this is one of the viruses that in poultry can cause really high mortality. So the birds get pretty sick with this and they often will die from it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a really good way of controlling this virus in domestic poultry. So when they do get sick with it, often what happens is that they end up having to euthanize large numbers of potentially healthy birds um, within quarantine zones to prevent it from spreading between farms. So it, it sucks, but it really is currently the only way we have of controlling this disease. And that's been that way for a while now. Um, of course, because of the high impact on poultry, it has the potential to have a big impact on people's job stability and on our food security because we like to eat chicken. It also has impacts on trade. So premises and, and countries and provinces that are affected with influenza generally can't export birds or meat products to countries that don't have it. Right now, I think that's probably all a big mess because it's kind of everywhere. Um, but in normal times, it's a big problem for trade when it gets into a farm. It also has the risk of being zoonotic. So there is always a risk with influenza in birds for transmission from birds to people. So that's one of the reasons we worry about it. And we'll talk a lot more about that today. Um, most of the time when infections happen in people with avian strains of influenza, it's in poultry workers. So people who are spending a lot of time in pretty closed, confined areas with these sick birds. And then of course, um, more of the reason why you guys are probably here listening to this talk today, there is the potential for avian influenza to have population level effects on wild birds, especially the current strain, which we'll talk about. So influenza in wild birds is not something new at all. Um, it was first detected in, in birds in 1878 from an outbreak in chickens in Italy. At that point, they didn't necessarily know that much about what it was and they called it foul plague. Infections of influenza happen every year um, across the world and they tend to happen in certain species of birds. So in our waterfowl, specifically in ducks, geese and shorebirds. So if you go out and do random surveillance um, in our wild bird population in these species, you, you can find influenza viruses pretty much every year, just like you can in people. Um, John's asking a question about there was something called bird flu that potentially was to be a big problem for humans. Not sure exactly what you mean by that, John. So right now there is a strain in Asia that is much more zoonotic than the strain that we have here that is causing some problems in people. That might be what you're thinking about. So again, it does have it does have the potential to, to transfer to people, but I'm going to tell you why this current strain that we have right now is actually a pretty low risk for that. So generally with the kind of annual humdum strains of influenza, birds don't really get very sick. Most of the time we detect it in birds that are 
outwardly healthy. So they don't necessarily have any signs that they're sick with this infection. And that's kind of what happens on a normal year. Um, ducks are considered to be the natural host for this virus and kind of the reservoirs of influenza viruses and birds. Surveillance for this virus has been going on in North America for the last 50 years, so a really long time. Um, the CWHU that I work for has been involved since 2005. And then from a more local level, every since I started working in this job, which is about three and a half years ago now, um, every single wild bird that comes through my lab will get tested for influenza. Even before this outbreak happened, there's a government program that's going on where they want to test a certain number of wild birds every year. And so we contribute um, regularly to that program, whether or not there's an outbreak going on. And until spring of this year, I had zero positive cases coming through our lab. Um, and the cost for this testing is covered by the Alberta Environment Parks, so the government group. Um, in Alberta, we see low path avian influenza pretty commonly during surveillance. And then once in a while, we do see occurrences of high path avian influenza, um, excuse me, with the most recent occurrences being in 2014 and 2015. And then of course this year. Why is it more common in waterfowl? Good question, Linda. And I actually don't necessarily know that answer. Um, for sure, infectious disease kind of in general is going to be more common, occur, more commonly occurring in animals when they congregate together. So part of it could be that, that waterfowl um, like to be together in large groups, especially during times of migration. So that could be part of it. Um, it's also possible maybe transmission. This is purely me kind of guessing on this one because I don't actually know the answer, um, but it may be that it transmit pretty transmits pretty well in water. So potentially the aquatic habitat could have something to do with that. Uh, but it seems like the the duck ducks and waterfowl are pretty well kind of adapted to this virus and they kind of coexist with it most of the time. Um, so looking at influenza um, throughout Canada since 2004, um, we do see occasional sporadic incursions of wild bird influenza into the domestic poultry industry. A couple of the larger ones happened in 2004 which happened in BC and had a cost of about $300 million. So these are pretty expensive outbreaks when they happen on the poultry side. More recently in 2014, there was an outbreak that hit both BC and Ontario um, and hit several farms. And you can see around 240,000 birds ended up being destroyed in that outbreak. And then the most recent one happened in 2016, but in Ontario, but that one was pretty small. So they do happen on a regular basis. This year's outbreak um, was first detected in wild birds in Newfoundland and Labrador in the Atlantic Flyway, specifically in a great black back gull in December of 2021. So quite a while, a while ago, they had the first wild bird case on the East Coast. And these guys unfortunately have been dealing with this outbreak for a lot longer than we have here in Alberta. Um, Within a couple months, it was detected in commercial flocks, again, still out east. So in February is when we first detected it in commercial poultry. Since then, it's proceeded to spread from east to west across all four migratory flyways, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. Um, and this is true for both Canada and for the US. So I think it was detected on the west coast pretty recently, actually, in this fall migration period in the US. So it's across all of North America. Jennifer's asking, are producers insured for these losses and calls? So they do get um, some compensation for it, Jennifer, but I don't, I don't believe that it's ever quite adequate. Um, so they do get some compensation for it, for sure, which helps encourage them to report when they have sick birds, because that can be a problem, um, because the effects of this are so devastating that farmers become resistant sometimes to reporting when they have an outbreak. Um, but you can't necessarily quantify all the, the loss that happens with these cases, right? So they're, they're pretty traumatic for the farmers. Um, I have, if, a pet, if I have a pet bird, should I be extremely careful when interacting with my bird feeders? So we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about which species of birds are being affected. But I'll say right now in general, um, to my knowledge, there have been no pet bird cases of this strain of avian influenza. So I wouldn't be super, super worried about it, but I would be careful with your feeders. And I'll talk about that towards the end. Good questions, you guys. 
Infections in the commercial poultry seem to be following the infections that are happening in wild birds. So we do think um, that disease transmission is happening from wild birds to poultry um, because you can follow it. You can follow migration, you can follow it moving across the flyways and it's been pretty consistent. So it's, it's hard to deny that the commercial, commercial poultry isn't getting it from wildlife in this case, unfortunately. And so here's a schematic of the four major flyways, so the Pacific, the Central, the Mississippi, and the Atlantic. This is kind of the stylized version of it. This one is a more accurate one. And if you squint or zoom in on your screen, you'll notice that um, in Alberta, especially in the northeast part of Alberta, we actually have all four of the flyways crossing over. So we have the potential for all birds from all four flyways to happen or occur um, within the province, which is kind of interesting. I'm going to show you guys a variety of different maps of the current distribution of this virus because they don't all necessarily agree with each other and they're all um, useful for different things. So this is a map that comes from USGS and was updated a couple weeks ago. So this one's a little bit older than the next ones I'll show you. Um, wild birds are indicated in green. Domestic birds are going to be in red and yellow. And then wild mammal cases are in blue. Um, so you can see all the cases happening in Alberta. And there's been a lot of um, some difficulties with reporting. So these, these numbers are probably a little bit out of date, even if this was two weeks ago. So it takes a while for things to be um, posted on these websites. This is some summary data from the CDC for the US showing kind of overall number of cases. So um, in wild birds, they've had confirmed about 3,124 cases closer to 50,000 or 50 million in um, poultry. And then there's only been one human case across North America to date, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, but that should be a little bit comforting if you're really worried about people getting this virus, because we know it's everywhere right now across North America, but people aren't really getting it. So that's, that's comforting for me, at least working with these birds. Um, this is another table this time from the CFIA showing the number of cases in commercial birds across the provinces. And you will notice, I'm not going to talk that much about commercial poultry, but you will notice um, that Alberta has been pretty hard hit on the commercial poultry side. Um, I've been working almost exclusively on the wild bird side, but I've definitely gotten my share of questions from uh, poultry producers because there's a lot of questions about why Alberta is being hit so hard. And I really can't give you a good reason for that. I think some of the other big poultry provinces like British Columbia have more experience dealing with these outbreaks because it's happened to them before and actually pretty recently. So that could be a factor that's playing a role here. Um, the next few pictures that I'm gonna show you guys all come from this one resource, which is called the Avian Influenza Dashboard um, that was put together by a bunch of people, including CFIA. And it's actually a really useful tool and seems to be one of the ones that's kept very up to date. So if you're gonna pick one resource to go look at to follow the avian influenza outbreak, I would suggest this one. So this is the picture that they have um, for the distribution across Canada. I think in this case, it's actually flipped. So I think the circles are wild birds and the stars are domestic cases. You'll notice that some of the circles are red and some of them are orange. So what happens when we get um, a positive case of influenza, it's usually detected within the province, so at one of the uh, government labs. So in our case, it's at the Edmonton lab and that is considered a presumptive positive. So in order for it to be a confirmed positive case, it actually has to go to CFIA headquarters out in Ontario to get confirmation. So they don't change color to, to red until they're confirmed. But the majority of the ones that are suspect cases at that point are already PCR positive. So they're very likely to be confirmed. It just takes a little bit of time. This is a close up of the cases that we've seen across Alberta. Um, for those of you who are scientists, you'll recognize that this data is probably extremely biased. So we don't have a lot of people up in northern Alberta who are going to be collecting dead birds or swabbing dead birds and submitting samples for testing. So our ability to sample um, in the more remote parts of the province is going to be a lot lower. There's us in Calgary who are taking in a lot of cases. And then Edmonton also gets a lot of birds in for testing. So those are kind of the two hot spots, um, just naturally by the way that we're doing surveillance. This is a graph showing the number of cases over time. I actually don't, I find this graph a little bit confusing. I think um, the peaks might be more related to kind of how the data is collected and reported. I feel like people sometimes pool cases before they submit them for reporting. So I, so I, don't, I don't find this graph particularly useful, but 
Um, you can look at the current number of cases, which shows that our cases are significantly down, especially in the province of Alberta. I'll show you our specific numbers in a little bit here, uh, but the numbers are way down. The numbers were much higher during the sp spring migration than they are during the fall migration. So what makes this year's influenza strain and outbreak a lot different from what we've seen in the past? The first thing is that it's a lot more widespread than we've seen with previous outbreaks. So I showed you some of the previous outbreaks within Canada where they often would only affect one province or a couple of provinces. Um, this current strain is affecting all of North America. So it's extremely widespread and it's, it's to a scale that has not, to my knowledge, been um, observed before. It's also really unique because this strain is actually making birds really sick. Um, like I told you, most ducks, when they get infected with influenza, don't actually show symptoms and we can detect virus in their feces, uh, but they don't necessarily get sick with it. This one is very different. Birds are dying and dying quite quickly from this infection. It's also a little bit different because unlike the, when you think about the seasonal flu, you probably think about um, a lung infection, which is a more classic way for this virus to present. Uh, but this particular strain is actually hitting more the nervous system, so the brain, um, which is a little bit different and explains partly the clinical signs that we're seeing in these sick birds. It's also affecting a lot wider variety of species. Um, so the most commonly affected right now are still the waterfowl and shorebirds. So we've seen a lot of Canada geese be positive here, um, as well as snow geese, a few ducks, actually not that many ducks, surprisingly, but um, a variety of other water birds, including gulls, cormorants, a whole bunch of different species. Um, but what is unusual is we're seeing other groups such as raptors, so things like hawks, eagles, falcons, lots of owls, and some vultures, not too many vultures, but a couple being affected. Here in Alberta, we actually, our second most common species affected is great horned owls, and that could partly be to do with the number of great horned owls we have, because we actually have a lot of great horned owls. Um, another group that's being affected is the corvids, the magpies, ravens, crows, and blue jays. And then more recently, we've started to see spillover into some mammalian species. So ooh, I don't remember now, a couple months ago, I started receiving reports um, from down near Frank Lake from some of the Austin birders down there that they were reporting all the time the, the dead birds that they were seeing down there that were dying from influenza. But they also started telling me stories about um, skunks that were being found dead in the area. Um, and they'd also seen these skunks eating some of the dead bird carcasses. So based on that information, we kind of made an effort to go out and collect some of these bodies um, and did find that they were positive and dying from influenza. More recently, there's been some other interesting species affected. So there's been one black bear that I know of in Quebec. We've had one suspect case here in Alberta in a black bear. Um, there's been a couple of bobcats that have been positive. And then some marine mammal species, which is a little bit of a weird one to me. I'm, I can't explain why they're getting it other than probably from waterfowl from pelagic bird species. Um, but we are seeing just a few cases in marine mammals kind of at this later stage in the outbreak. So for the first couple of groups, these animals are all scavengers, which is how we think that they're getting it is from actually scavenging and eating affected birds. So this is the part where if you are worried about looking at dead bird pictures and seeing some videos of sick birds, please feel free to go have a coffee break. Um, I have just three videos that I'm going to show you that come from the local wildlife centers. So I get a lot of cases submitted from the Calgary Wildlife Rehab Society, as well as from AWIC, the one in Madden. And some of these videos come from them. So first one is a Canada goose. And I told you that these birds, um, the virus is targeting their brains. So they present as being what we call neurologic. So abnormal behavior. This bird is very, very weak and has slight tremors as well as just kind of abnormal kind of stereotypic behavior. It's also got um, a cloudy blue looking eye because it actually has um, some swelling in the eye, which we only saw in geese, but was a pretty commonly reported thing by even members of the public were noticing that these sick geese had blue eyes. This is a great horned owl showing something very similar. So kind of seizure like twitching behavior and, and uh, blinking of the eyes. And when he does open his eyes, he's got very um, asymmetric pupils. So telling us that there's something going on in the brain of this animal. And then a red-tailed hawk, very similar. This guy's mostly just very weak. Um, so these are some of the ways that these birds are presenting. 
So I told you most of them are neurologic. They have inflammation happening in their brain. So they're going to have things like tremors, seizures, incoordination, abnormal behavior. Sometimes they'll still be trying to fly around. And so people will report that they're flying erratically and sometimes crashing into things. Um, in the geese specifically, they often have cloudy blue looking eyes. And then sometimes we'll get a history of them having diarrhea as well, but that was more uncommon in this outbreak. Um, one of the most useful uh, lesions, so abnormalities that I see at autopsy on these birds um, is actually a lesion happening in the pancreas. So this is the pancreas of a bird, um, usually an organ that isn't really affected by disease, but with this particular virus, you get these small areas of um, inflammation and then actually death of the pancreatic tissue. And if you see this, there aren't a ton of other things. There's a couple other viruses that can do this, um, but there's not very much else. So this, this lesion is actually really useful for me because often if I see it, I can make the call that it probably is influenza right at the time of autopsy. I don't have to wait for all of the testing results to come back to say, to at least give it a presumptive positive. This is another pancreas. Um, that is more severely affected. So all of these circles, these dark looking circles are areas of infection and inflammation in the pancreas. And then this one's just a little bit different looking, but has similar areas. These ones are more tan looking areas of inflammation and tissue death. A weird organ to be talking about, but it, it's a really useful thing for me as a pathologist to help narrow down my potential causes in these cases. And another one that just shows really kind of diffuse um, reddening. So this, this pancreas is way redder than it should be. The vessels of the intestine around it are also really red. So they're really full of blood more than they should be. Um, another one of the changes that we see is sometimes the body cavities will have some fluid in them, as well as something that we call fibrin, which is this kind of gelatinous looking um, clot that sits on top of the tissue. So we saw that sometimes. This is actually the bird's spleen. Um, and in these birds, sometimes the spleen will be quite big. So two to three times the normal size, and it will be kind of this weird mottled color, which is also abnormal. Um, this is actually the, the reproductive tract, the oviduct of, I think, a, a Canada goose probably. And in the, the reproductively active birds, especially the females, one of the things we saw was really, again, big, dark looking blood vessels. So just blood vessels that are really full of blood more than they should be and is quite kind of prominent when you're doing autopsies on these animals. Similar thing within the brain. So this is a normal looking brain on the right side here. And this is a brain that has really congested dark blood vessels. So this is a, a pretty subtle change and not something that I can make a, a definitive call on, but it's definitely something that we saw consistently in a lot of these birds. Um, I'm not going to show you guys very much of what, what I see under the microscope because it's going to look like a bunch of blue and purple and pink to you guys. Uh, but this is actually the same pancreas from one of those pictures cut really, really, really thin and then put under the microscope. So normal pancreas is all of this kind of purple looking area. And then these pale spots are areas where you actually have damage and loss of the tissue from this virus. So that's what I'm looking for when I look at these tissues under my microscope. And that's evidence that there's a viral infection happening here. This is just a close up of the same thing. So this area with a lot of extra clear space and loss of those normal cells that should be there. Okay, moving on to talk about some of the frequently asked questions. So hopefully this will answer some of the questions that you guys have about this virus and wild birds. So one of the common ones is how, how is it being spread? Um, the most common kind of classic route that we know happens is through direct contact between infected birds, um, through any of their oral or nasal secretions, as well as through feces. So basically any secretions that are coming from that animal can shed the virus and pass it to other birds. Things that we call fomites, which you guys may have heard of with COVID. Um, so transmission of the virus through kind of another object. So it can be people's hands, um, in the case of poultry, it can be trucks driving between poultry barns. It can be litter that gets moved between poultry barns. All of those things have the potential to transmit the virus, although that is less important than the first three that I mentioned here. Um, we think that there is some transmission happening through contaminated feed and water. So for example, geese that may be out feeding on grain fields that are then harvested and fed to poultry is one potential way that it's getting in. And we actually have a, the University of Calgary is doing a study to look specifically at answering this question 
in this particular outbreak. Um, less likely possible means of transmission include things like rodents, um, pets, so people's dogs or cats, if they're going in and out of the barns, could bring stuff in on their feet. Um, insects could potentially transmit it, not super likely with this virus to my knowledge. Um, and then one of the things we're really worried about is happening in these cases that is actually a bit of airborne transmission, especially in the cases of the poultry barns where some of them, even when they have really good biosecurity measures to keep this virus out are still getting infected. And so we think that some transmission is happening through the airs and through the ventilation system in those barns. One of the reasons this virus is such a problem is that, that it can survive for a long period of time in the environment, especially in cold temperatures, which is common here. Um, so for poultry producers, having really good biosecurity measures that prevent all of these methods of transmission are going to be really important to keep it out of their flocks. So are people at risk of infection? Um, so always with influenza type A, which is what the birds get, there is a potential for it to jump into people. In general, though, it's pretty uncommon for that to happen. I told you about pigs being an important mixing vessel, so it's much more common for pigs infected with the flu to be able to pass it to people. Very uncommon for birds to pass it to people. And then usually in cases where it does get passed to people, like the one case that's happened so far, um, it usually won't then go on to be able to transmit between people. So question about how can we protect wild birds from avian flu? Alan, that is a really hard question. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that we can do, but honestly, they're with wildlife, with cases like this, there really isn't a ton that we can do. Um, so we'll talk about one or two things that might that might be possible for us to do that can help, but we're really not going to be able to prevent it from spreading throughout the populations, and we kind of just have to wait for it to settle down, um, which is unfortunate, but is kind of the reality with this virus. So. With this particular strain, people are at a very low risk of infection. Um, and I told you already about the one case that happened and uh, based on conversations with people, they actually aren't sure whether this was a true case of infection. The person did test positive on, I think an, either an oral or a nasal swab, um, but given that they're working in a poultry barn, it's possible for them to have virus just sitting there and not necessarily causing disease. The only clinical sign that this person reported was that they were a little bit fatigued. So they did not get very sick, even if they were infected with this virus. So the risk to people is generally um, considered quite low. And there's been no infections originating from wild birds, to my knowledge. It's only that one case reported in a, in a poultry worker. Um, the story is a little bit different in Asia, which is what I think John might have been thinking of in his first question. Um, and in Asia, they have a very different strain. It's still H5N1, but it's very different from the one that we have here right now. And that one is causing severe disease in people. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that because I honestly have not done any work on that. Um, but it, And it is a different strain from what we're seeing here. The problem with influenza is that it's always changing, which means that there is always a small risk. And because of that, our general message since the start of this outbreak has been that people should not try to handle sick um, or dead wildlife at this time. Um, if you do need to handle it for whatever reason, and I'm not gonna, if you work for a wildlife rehab place, I'm not gonna stop you from handling sick birds. I still need occasional birds to be submitted to me for testing. So people do have to handle them. So if you are gonna handle dead birds, um, we recommend that you wear gloves as well as a mask. And then if you wash your hands well with soap and water afterwards, it will kill the virus. So you should be safe. We also recommend any carcasses be double bagged just to prevent any leakage of fluids that could contaminate. Um, the surrounding environment. Are my pets at risk? This question's already come up in the chat box. So are my animals at risk if they are around dead birds? Um, this virus is particularly a concern for other birds, not for any other species. So I have mentioned a few cases in mammals, but those are pretty rare. So pet birds are for sure have the potential to be at risk, but as I said, there's been no reported cases of them actually getting it. If you happen to have a pet bird that is one of those species that we've talked about, so I have talked to some of the falconers in Alberta um, who are concerned about this, and I do think that their birds in particular are at higher risk, and part of that is because they'll often be eating wild game too, right? So they are at risk of getting it from eating infected wild birds. So if your pet bird is not one of those at-risk species and you're not feeding them, wild game, then they should be at pretty low risk. I will talk about feeders in just a second, Val. It's a good question. 
Um, there have currently been no reports of infection in pets, such as cats or dogs. Back during the H1N1 outbreak, we did see some cases happening in cats, so I would never say never, especially in a species that does like to eat wild birds. Most of the birds that a cat is going to catch, though, are not the species that are likely to have this virus, and so far there have been no cases um, detected, and we would test for this. If we did an autopsy on a cat that had um, lesions that were suggestive of this virus, then we could test for it and figure it out, and so far that has not happened. I think we have had we've had at least one or two cases come in where it was a concern, but so far they've been negative. Um, Non-avian livestock species like cattle are really at no risk. So I've had people calling in worried about their cattle who are drinking from dugouts where they've had dead birds and cattle don't really get infected with um, type A influences. They tend to get infected with type D influences. So their risk should be quite low, even if they are drinking from a pond that's infected. Other livestock like pigs, if you had pet pigs, I would be potentially a little bit worried, but most of our pigs um, are kept indoors and not near wild birds. So usually it's not a high risk. And so far there have been no reported cases of this strain in pigs. Um, so what should you do if you find sick or dead birds? Um, in general, at this point in the outbreak, we're actually not soliciting people um, start collecting or bringing in carcasses like crazy, especially if it's just one or two dead birds. Um, we do want you to be reporting them so they can be reported um, preferably to the province. And I'll give you the, the number in a second here. Um, but they can also be reported through the CWHC online, which will end up coming to me if you do it through the Alberta um, link. The following situations remain of interest. So anytime, even outside of this outbreak, if you come across a cluster of mortality, so something involving like 20 or more um, individuals, or if you see mammals associated with dead birds, then definitely we want to hear about it. And if possible, we may actually try and get some of those bodies submitted for autopsy and testing. Um, for wild birds, you can contact the government, so AEP, Alberta Environment and Parks, at this number. Um, or you can report it online and it'll come to me and I'll be happy to hear from you, but very busy. Um, on the domestic poultry side or for backyard flock owners and pets, if you're worried about your pets, then I have to refer you to your clinical veterinarian because I'm not going to be very much help with those. Um, people are also asking about carcass disposal. So what can they do with the carcass if they're worried about it being infected with influenza? So right now we don't have, have any type of coordinated effort to collect and remove these carcasses. This is something that um, I personally kind of wish that we had um, been doing or could, could be doing because I do think that there would be some advantages to this because you're technically removing um, a source of virus from the population. The problem that it, is that it, we just don't have um, the manpower and the money and the time to do this and we don't want members of the public necessarily going out and doing it because of the potential zoonotic risk and the risk that they could get infected. Um, if you do come across birds, especially if they're bodies that are in a, a place where the public are going to be exposed to them and you really think that they should be moved, um, I encourage you to contact your local municipalities, so in this case the city of Calgary, um, and they will sometimes come out and collect the bodies, especially if they're in a place where if they're getting multiple calls about them, I think they're more likely to go and do something. Um, standard disposal for these bodies is totally fine. So they can, they can be disposed of in your garbage if you need to. They can be buried. They can be burned. Um, the one problem with the garbage disposal part is that we know that um, scavengers can be affected by feeding on the carcasses. So there is some risk with disposing of it in the garbage, depending what happens with that garbage. Um, because it could potentially then get consumed by scavengers. But burying them or burning them is a totally acceptable way of disposing of them, but I'm not going to encourage you guys to do this. Um, I do sometimes encourage farmers if they're out and they, they kind of are used to dealing with bodies. In that case, I kind of may encourage them a little bit more to go ahead and, and bury them if possible. Bird feeders. So this has come up twice already during this talk, which is good. Um, so right now, we are encouraging people to take down their feeders, um, but that isn't necessarily because we think there's a high risk for birds feeding at the feeders. So I told you most of the songbird species um, are not generally being affected with this virus. So I don't think, I'm trying to remember if I've had any cases of songbirds being affected, and I don't think we've seen any through our lab at least. 
Um, doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but it's pretty unlikely. So we're still recommending that people take down their feeders until this outbreak is over. So a couple of months from now, when migration is over, um, I would go ahead and put the feeders back up because um, the birds will be migrated and the risk of influenza in general is going to be a lot lower. Um, if your feeders are up, then this is true all the time, but we recommend regular cleaning and disinfection of your feeders because feeders in general are a really important place for disease transmission to happen. So because they're sites where birds are congregating, they're also eating at the same time. So there's it's really easy for them to transmit diseases that are transmitted by saliva. Um, so some diseases like oops, trichomonas, um, finch conjunctivitis and salmonella are all diseases that I see here in Alberta that are transmitted commonly through feeders. Um, so anytime you start to see sick birds around your feeders, you should definitely take them down. And then the CWHE website has some really good guidelines on how to clean your feeders. And I know that there are, including myself, not very long ago, a lot of people that don't know that you need to regularly clean your feeders and that it's actually really quite important to keep um, disease out of your songbird population. How to prevent infection. This has already come up too. Um, so for, for pet birds and the poultry industry, um, and for you guys too, if you're going out birding, good biosecurity is gonna help reduce the risk that you're spreading this infection wherever you go. So I talked about fomites, things like boots can potentially be a way that the virus is being spread around. So if you are going out, I encourage you to still go out. I'm an avid birder and I like going out to, to bird watch. Um, so you can still go out, but just try and make sure that you clean your boots really well um, before you go somewhere else. So if you can clean your boots, preferably with some dilute bleach works really well. Um, then you're not going to risk moving the virus around. If you do handle birds, dead or alive, I recommend wearing gloves and a mask and washing your hands afterwards should keep you and them safer. Um, and then if you have pet birds or poultry, keeping them away from wild birds is going to be really important. Keeping things like feeders away from other species that might be feeding around the area, especially chickens and pigs, is going to be important. And unfortunately, that's about... That's about all the recommendations that I have um, on the wildlife front for helping to keep transmission down. Like I said, it's a really hard virus to control. And I really do think um, that we kind of need to rely on the birds and their immune systems to adapt to this virus um, to get it back under control, which I think is already happening. So some of the questions that got submitted for this talk that I really can't answer um, are partly because we're still kind of in the middle of it. And the first one is how bad is this outbreak? Um, so it is, to use the way too commonly used term, unprecedented for influenza in wild birds. Um, so I, I can't tell you right now what the, the total numbers are. Um, the numbers that actually come through the lab and get confirmed are only going to be a small proportion of the birds that have actually died from this virus. And I've shown you kind of some of the numbers. I'm going to summarize for you in a second the, the numbers that we've seen in the Calgary lab. So I really can't answer this question for you right now. Hopefully down the road, we'll be able to answer it a little more concretely. Same with what percentage of the infected birds die. So I am a pathologist. Every bird that I see other than biopsies coming off birds is dead. So I am extremely biased in that front. I never get to see them if they go on to survive this virus, but there are going to be a subset of them that are doing that because not all the geese are dying, not all the great horned owls are dying. So we know that some of them are recovering and developing immunity to this virus. I just can't tell you what percentage of birds that is. Um, and then I kind of want to end on, on hopefully a more positive note because I, I realize that this, this lecture is probably a little bit depressing and I'm very biased, like I said, because I work with dead things all the time. So I forget um, how depressing talking about some of this stuff can be. And I want to remind you guys uh, that I, even as somebody who works almost exclusively with dead things, um, I'm not super worried about this virus causing devastating huge effects on the population. Um, and this is some of the reasons why. So this virus in particular is one that birds have lived with for a very long time and they are highly adapted to dealing with it. Um, so I think in all likelihood, they're actually going to recover just fine from this. They'll probably show a drop in numbers for a year or two because of the high mortality that it's causing, but I think they're gonna recover. And I think this, this particular strain is not gonna be a problem for them. Um, going forward. We could see recurrence next year because not all of the birds are going to have been exposed this time around, um, but I do think that they're going to adapt to it. Also looking at the populations that have been the hardest hit, so things like the Canada geese and the great horned owls, 
their populations before this were actually doing quite well. Um, so there's been some speculation about potentially this outbreak being as severe as it was because of how well things like the snow geese are doing up north um, with the changes in their feeding habits and more feeding on um, grain fields. So it could be that this is in some ways a little bit of a natural population control, at least for those abundant populations. Um, it's kind of, we're going to have to wait for time to kind of tell us the truth of that, but I, I truly am hopeful that um, this is not going to have huge long lasting impacts on our wild bird population. Uh, at the local level, so within our lab, the numbers of cases that we're seeing during fall migration are way, way, way lower than what we saw during spring migration. So here's a table showing um, the number of birds that we've been testing compared to the number of positive cases that we've had. So this month or last month, I guess now, we've only had two positive birds. I think one Canada goose and one great horned owl, which is so many fewer than I was seeing during the spring outbreak. And I also get a lot of um, reports of sick birds through the CWG website. So I have in the spring, I was getting emails and phone calls almost every single day, multiple a day about people finding sick neurologic birds. And I have not been getting that in the fall. And I don't think it's just because people are tired of, of calling and emailing me. Um, I think it's actually because the number of affected birds has gone way down. So I am pretty hopeful that although we're seeing, we're still seeing cases right now, for sure, we're seeing a lot fewer cases. So I think that um, we're kind of nearing the end of the current outbreak. So I'm staying hopeful because, and I hope you guys will too. Um, so that's it for my lecture. I'll open it up for questions and you guys are welcome to turn on your, your video and your microphones if you actually want to ask me with your voices, which is always nice for me. Um, so Dana, Linda had a question about do strains like this generally only last one year? Um, that's a good question, Linda. So in the previous outbreaks, it's been that way. Um, the outbreaks haven't gone past a year in the wild bird population. So once they go away, they haven't been coming back. I don't know that that'll be the case with this virus just because it's so widespread. I think that there's potential that we'll have populations that have not been exposed yet um, and may still be exposed next year. But I, I can't answer that one for sure, but it's a really good question. I'm hoping that it's gone through enough of the population that it's kind of going to peter out. Um, it, this is Anne speaking. Um, I had a, a question about, you talked about this virus going sort of from east to west in North America. Um, people who've been in England this summer have seen a lot of it in England. Is, is it the same virus in Europe as it is here? So I think it is, and that's a really good question. And I haven't, I just haven't done enough reading to confirm for sure, because it is confusing, right? Because it is for sure an H5N1 virus, but I'm not 100% sure that it's the same strain. I think that it is in Europe, though. Um, I don't think the Asia strain is the, is the same, but I think the one in Europe right now is the same strain. Thank you. Looks like Carla had a question. Can you please speak more to taking bird feeders down? If songbirds are not affected and if feeders are not near waterfowl or poultry, why take the feeders down? So Carla, bird feeders are always a very controversial issue. Um, within the veterinary world, because a lot of us are avid birders and I know how important those feeders are, especially on the Christmas bird count, right? Super important spot to see um, a number of species. And in the winter months, especially those feeders can potentially be important food sources for birds. Um, so I agree with you. I think if you decide not to take your feeders down, as long as you're cleaning them regularly, I think it's okay to have them up. That's my personal opinion, the general recommendation um, for Alberta right now is that people take down their feeders, but I do agree with you. It's not maybe the most logical thing ever, especially because we are not really seeing it in, in birds that use bird feeders. So that's a fair question. Um, so Dana, this is Anne. I have a question about, um, you said previously, or this year, what you're seeing are predators and the Corvid group being infected. And presumably these are birds that would have predated on um, other birds before when there have been the viruses sort of swept through. And also, um, yeah, so uh, why this year do you think it's affected the corvids and the uh, other predators? 
So it's a, it's a different virus than it was in previous years. And that is one of the key things that does make it different is how, um, how many different species it's affecting. And I'm not sure why this particular strain is. That's going to require somebody who does more molecular work than I do to look at transmission and why it's being transmitted through to scavengers, which is a little bit different. Um, I told you that there have been cases in the past of things like cats being affected, but I don't necessarily know that the cats that were affected with H1N1, uh, I don't know that it was from scavenging on sick birds. I think it was probably more likely through aerosol respiratory tract transmission, because I think that's what those cats were showing clinically um, were signs of pneumonia, not evidence of a, a brain infection. There's a question from Lenora about, is the disease present in Central and South America? So Lenora, unfortunately, I haven't, I haven't done enough reading because I've been so busy with dealing with cases in Canada. Um, I would be, I'm sure that probably Central America, because of the way that it's spread, I wouldn't be surprised. And remember that a lot of um, the birds who are up here are going to be traveling down to those areas. So I can't imagine that um, it wouldn't be making its way down there. Hopefully the birds if they're getting it up here, are actually going to be developing immunity before they make the long trek down south. So um, I can't answer that question more specifically than that. We also generally have a little bit less information from down there, right? Because it depends, again, on people um, sampling and testing for this virus. But I'm sure it's being done to some extent. Dana, is anything being done to address the wet market issue? That's another thing that um, I'm not really a big part of. I'm sure that it's it's a hot topic and a place um, for the potential evolution of a lot of different viruses. So I know that the, the CDC and the OIE um, do a lot of surveillances in places like that because of the potential for evolution of, of disease. Um, I don't know how much jurisdiction they have, like there's going to be all sorts of issues around changing those type of things, especially when those markets um, are kind of a cultural phenomenon too, right? They're potentially, get out of here, Clem, potentially um, important for the people that go to them. So although it's a problem from our perspective, I think it's a, it's a, a bigger problem to fix, right? I think there's a lot of things that go into those type of um, mitigation strategies, but I'm sure that there are people working on it because we know that those places, just like things like the bushmeat trade, are in another important place where um, zoonotic diseases can evolve because people are eating um, wild and sometimes uncooked meat um, in places where there's a lot of different diseases in tropical zones. So we know that certain places like the wet markets are hot spots for disease. So I'm sure people are working on correcting that if possible. Good question. And um, so the, in this case, with this particular virus, bats are not a reservoir. You're saying that pigs are, or the birds themselves are the primary reservoir. Um, yeah, so, yep. Are bats yeah. reservoir for this kind of uh, virus? So bats, people like to blame bats for a lot of things. I like bats a lot, probably I as much as birds. <laughs> I don't want to hear that they're the ones spreading it. Yeah, and to my knowledge, there's zero evidence that bats play a big role in influenza. So they play, they definitely play a role in a lot of other viruses, but birds, the waterfowl are actually the reservoirs for this virus in general. Um, so if we're gonna blame anyone, unfortunately it's them because they're the ones that keep it persisting in the environment, even during years when we don't have outbreaks. And then the pigs are more of like the mixing vessel. So they're not necessarily known as being reservoir host. They're more known as a, as a place where you can get mixing and reassortment of those different strains. So John asked a question about uh, why would the spring birds be more affected than the fall birds? Um, and that's because it was new at that time, John. So um, it was kind of the bird's first exposure to this new strain, excuse me, this new strain of virus, which is why it hit them so hard. So at this stage, a lot of the birds, as they're they're gathering again for fall migration, they have already been exposed to this virus at some point in the last four months or before that. Um, so there should be birds that have resistance, which is why I think we're seeing fewer birds affected in the fall. Um, Lenora is asking, when you handle the infected birds doing necropsies on the birds, are the birds then incinerated? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, the birds, whenever I do, I actually do all of my um, wildlife necropsies in general with pretty high biosecurity. So I do them wear, either wearing an N95 mask 
um, that I've been fit tested for, or I do them in a, in a bio bubble or a bio safety cabinet to keep myself and the people around me safe. Um, afterwards, all of them get disposed of the same way that we dispose all of our other waste. So that can either be through an incinerator, which there is one next door to us. Otherwise, it goes to a company that actually does. I think it's potentially not incineration or might still be incineration. It's either incineration or more of a chemical biodigestion that happens. Um, but either way, it's going to be a process that will get rid of this virus. So this virus is not particularly resistant to things like incineration. So incineration would definitely kill this virus. Great questions, you guys. Keep them coming. <laughs> Claudia says, where and when were the first cases reported in Alberta? Oh, you're going to make me think hard now. Um, I actually don't remember whether, so the two places that have been looking and testing is um, the government lab in Edmonton and then us, at the diagnostic services unit. Unfortunately, I do remember that the first case actually was detected despite all the surveillance that we were doing. The first case was detected in poultry, so in domestic poultry, which was a little bit of a surprise to me because we were definitely expecting it. We were watching the progress of this virus, of this infection um, from east to west. So I was kind of just waiting for it to pop up in wildlife and we were doing all of our normal testing, but being extra kind of vigilant looking for it. So it did pop up first um, in commercial birds. And then I can't remember what the location was for my first case. I think that it definitely was a, a goose. And I think it came in through either through CWRS or through um, the center AWIC in Madden. So I think it was probably somewhere relatively local that first case. Um, but after that, it, the number of cases went up extremely quickly. So I think it was within a couple of days of the first commercial case being reported, we started having um, cases being positive in wild birds. And I know the first several were Canada geese that were coming in as well as pretty quickly after that, a couple of great horned owls. Hat's asking, do we know if there are other vectors of the virus that can transmit to waterfowl? Um, I'm thinking of Somers ick. So I mentioned insects, Pat, a little bit. We don't think that um, other like non-avian species play a big role. We think that it mostly circulates um, within the birds themselves. So there is potential for something like an insect to carry the virus, but it would be more of a case of the, the virus being kind of like on the outside of the insect, not necessarily inside of the insect, like we see with a lot of our um, other diseases, things like parasites usually have intermediate hosts that are completely different species like invertebrates, like insects and snails and things like that. Um, so we don't think that's happening with this virus. We think that transmission is, is mostly bird to bird, if not completely bird to bird. Um, John's asking, can sampling water from lake and ponds indicate the occurrence of the virus? That's a good question, John. So um, there's been some work happening through the lab in Abbotsford in BC, where they've done um, some work with soil samples from the bottom of ponds to see if they can detect influenza virus in those samples of PCR, and they are detecting it. Um, the problem becomes kind of like, are these viruses that are from this year? Are they from last year? Um, how useful are samples like that in an actual outbreak? I'm not so sure. So we can detect it, and there is work going on right now to, to look at that as a potential way of of tracking the infection. The work that's happening in Calgary, they're actually gonna do some water sampling as well as air sampling um, on around premises that have been affected. So around poultry barns that have been positive, they're gonna go in and they're gonna test um, the water both in the barn and then outside of the barn. I think they're gonna actually try and swab um, wild bird feces that are on the property too, which I think will be a bit of a challenge. Um, so they're gonna look at a whole bunch of potential ways that transmission could be happening to try and figure it out. People are told they can add animal feces to green boxes for composting. Would composting temperatures kill the virus? Uh, good question, Lauren. So I think that composting does kill this virus because I know that one of the ways that they've looked at of dealing with bodies in the poultry barns is through composting. So I think the temperature that compost reaches actually can be high enough to kill the virus, um, which is a good thing. Like I said, it's actually not, it's not the toughest virus around when it comes to um, decontamination. It's not actually that hard to kill, which is why things like washing your hands works really well to get rid of this virus. 
Um, so composting actually potentially does have the ability to kill it. So if, um, if a, a, a bird farmer has to um, eliminate their flock, uh, how long is the farm considered contagious after they've eliminated the birds? That's a good question too. I think there is a there is a wait period. I don't actually know what the number is, but I think there is a certain period that they have to wait before they're allowed to repopulate that barn with birds. Um, and you can imagine like all of that time when that barn is empty, that is going to be costing those poultry producers money. Um, so that's part of part of the cost to them. And it does take a while. I'm not sure whether they do additional testing of the environment or anything like that to prove that they're negative. I think they just leave the barns empty for a certain amount of time and they probably have a whole um, suite of decontamination procedures that they do to get that barn clean again. So there's a question about, um, in, in England, there was testing of the air downwind of zoos, which showed that animals were in the zoo. Could this be done with birds? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, John, but they are doing, so the group in Calgary, there are machines, and I haven't seen these, so I can't tell you a lot of detail about them, but there are machines that they can use to test the air and look for actual virus in the air, which is pretty cool. Um, I think they somehow like suck in and compress a bunch of the air and then they have some sort of filter that is able to actually catch the virus. It's small enough to catch the virus particles. And then you can do PCR on those samples to look for the virus in the air. So that is something that's being done right now to try and figure out how important um, air transmission is for this virus. But I think it's a, it's a relatively new technology. I hadn't, I've never seen one before, like I said, and I hadn't heard of anybody using that um, until pretty recently. Yeah, I think what I was uh, hearing or reading that um, if you were to sample the air downwind of a zoo, um, the, I guess, DNA particles or something were being released by the animals just through their own activities. And those, they could, they could pick up the DNA and then use that DNA to determine what animals were actually uh, um, in the zoo. And, they, and they've done that with water as well. They, you can sample water uh, from a pond and determine what species are living within that pond. So I thought if there was some way of um, detecting the virus from the RNA that uh, they is specific to that particular virus by using air sampling. Yeah, so that's a, it would be doing exactly the same thing um, and looking for RNA from the virus instead of of DNA, and they would probably, in this case, use some more specific what we call primers to look very specifically for that one. Um, type of virus instead of looking kind of across the board for a variety of different types of DNA. So Stephanie's telling a story about uh, finding a dead magpie and calling 311 and they told you to put it in your green bin. Um, yeah, so so it should be okay, Stephanie. I know I still, uh, it'll kind of time will tell whether um, there's more that we should have done kind of in this situation. But like I said, it's really, it's really hard to coordinate something like um, a mass cleanup of carcasses. So I know it's happened at some kind of in certain spots where there was a lot of bodies that it happened that people cleaned, um, did some collection of carcasses and proper disposal, but um, it's a really hard thing to do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be super worried. I think if you picked up that magpie and put it in your green bin, that even that helps, right? Because you're taking it out of the environment and hopefully decreasing access of other birds to that body. Um, Pat's asking about my screen picture. I don't actually know if I remember what I think this was a, a moth and not a butterfly, and it was definitely at a zoo, um, but I can't honestly remember. It's from a while ago. It's just a picture that I really liked, um, so I often have it in my presentations. I don't know enough about invertebrates anymore. I don't work with them very often. Sometimes frogs. I guess those are vertebrates. I don't really work with invertebrates at all, unless somebody submits a, a bee to me, which has happened a couple times, or a cricket. I think we've come to the end of questions. Thank you guys so much for coming. So um, I'll, like I said before, I'll give these slides to Anne. There's a bunch of um, resources on here. If you guys are interested in learning more about any of this stuff, there's a whole bunch of resources out there. 
Um, you're also welcome to reach out to me. My email is pretty easy to find these days on the CWHE website. So you're definitely welcome to reach out with questions.